Good morning. Welcome to worship here on this well, slightly cold morning, a little chilly out there, isn't it? Uh, but thank you for being here today as we uh, look into the Gospel of John. We're going to be finding Jesus as he's beginning his ministry, right? As we kind of been talking about post-Christmas. Uh, today he's calling some of the first disciples. We're going to see the calling of Philip and Nathaniel today. Uh, and we get to see what is... I don't know, I've always been inspired by this and really loved this story because of the responses that we get to see in Philip and Nathaniel and how, how things really just come together uh, with some true excitement at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So blessings on your worship today as we dive into that text. Uh, announcements today, uh, let's see, the Red Cross, we're having a Red Cross blood drive on February 4th and then also on April 28th. So mark your calendars and uh, we'll have a blood drive here on those Sundays. And uh, the big announcement coming up is our single service followed by the voters meeting. That's, that's on January 28th, so we got a couple more Sundays. Uh, but mark your calendar, make sure, because that service is at 10 a.m. So single service at 10 a.m. followed directly by the voters meeting. And I think that's about it for announcements. So blessings, and let us begin with confession and absolution on page one. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment of silent reflection upon our sins. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together hymn number 396, Arise and Shine in Splendor.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for this morning is taken from 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak for your servant hears. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The epistle for today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will raise also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For, as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were brought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory to you. 
The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we sing together hymn number 411, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we've successfully made it from Advent into Christmas, through Epiphany, and now into the telling of the beginning of Christ's ministry as we walk towards Lent and eventually Easter. It is a compelling part of the church year and that I've always liked because the beginning of Jesus' ministry is an exciting time. It's interesting to see how Jesus begins everything and calls his disciples. 
And the disciples he calls are not exactly the most likely of characters. They're not the ones you would think of Jesus seeking out. The disciples probably would have thought of themselves as unlikely candidates for a life of discipleship. But maybe this is pretty typical for joining a church. I don't know. It does remind me of the joke about the lady who asked her friend if she would be open to attending church with her. The friend just shook her head and said, no, I haven't gone to church in a long time. Besides, it's probably too late for me. I think I've broken all seven commandments. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's more of a pastor joke. Trust me, I I find that hilarious. And and really all too real, too, because nobody comes to a church thinking that they're good enough to join. Or if they do, it probably means that they're going to be the worst of the bunch. A little humility puts us in the right place when coming before God. From the beginning of the New Testament church, starting with the 12 disciples themselves, what we see is a group of unlikely students. Jesus picks these guys to be his disciples, his students, his eventual leaders and emissaries, and really not a one of them are what the world would call top pick material. Their identities as leaders are surprising. Which also reminds me of the man who wakes up one morning dreading going to church. He tells his wife, I don't want to go to church today. The music is slow, the sanctuary is cold, the people are mean, and the preacher's sermons are incredibly ineffective. His wife tells him, too bad, get up, you have to go. He complains, why? She says, because you're the pastor, that's why. (laughs) That joke is entirely fictional, nothing like that ever happens. But the jerk joke works because of the surprise, right? And that surprise continues in the calling of the first disciples from our text today. And okay, maybe not the first, very first disciples, right? That's, that's Andrew, John, and Peter in the verses right before our reading. And then probably James and John are called, you know, the, the exact order gets a little hazy across the gospel accounts. But then we get to Philip and Nathaniel. So they're probably like six and seven. But it's still very early, day two of Jesus gathering his disciples. That's why our reading began with the next day, because this happens right after the calling of the first few. The passage tells us that Jesus decides to leave the area where John the Baptist had been baptizing, and he goes up north to Galilee. There he finds Philip. And Philip says to him, and he says to Philip, follow me. Philip, like Andrew, John, and Peter before him, is called directly by Jesus. Jesus invites them to follow him. Jesus chooses them. And while the scripture keeps pointing this out, we tend to miss it because we don't really understand the history and the traditions. We read this and we don't really think it sounds odd, but it is. And that's why it keeps getting highlighted in the text. See, at this time, the rabbinical education system doesn't really work like that. There, were, there weren't established educational institutions for you know, continuing your education after you finished your primary synagogue education. You didn't really go off to college somewhere, like today. If you were a good student, like you know, most weren't, this was kind of the exception to the rule, you could con- continue to choose to continue your education by finding a rabbi and dedicating yourself to following him. You could choose to, to sit at his feet, as it was said, and become his student. But more than that, more, more than a student, really, really, this wasn't just educational. Now, in English, we call these students disciples. But that's from a Latin word. It doesn't really get us back to Scripture. In the Greek New Testament, these guys are called mathetes. But that's not really a word that we know in English that well, because there aren't many English words that come from that Greek word, which is kind of a little surprising, given how common the word is in the New Testament, but it's just how it is. Closest thing we have is mathematics, which originally meant just to study anything, and only eventually linguistically evolved into the study of numbers. But for our discussion purposes, we should really be looking for the Hebrew word for these disciple guys, because that's what they were, they were right? They're a bunch of Jewish guys following a rabbi. So let's bring this back to its Hebrew roots. The word we're looking for here is Talmud. 
And maybe you've heard of the Talmud, right, which is a Jewish collection of teachings on the law, and it's a related word, but this word is Talmud, and it's like, like a student, but way more intense. Basically, those who excelled in their early studies and showed a particular interest in religious and scriptural matters might continue their education under the guidance of a rabbi, a respected religious teacher and scholar. To become a Talmud, the aspiring young man would approach a rabbi, expressing their desire to study with him. And this process could involve a form of selection or testing, as rabbis would want to ensure that their disciples were committed and capable of r r rigorous theological study. It would also elevate the rabbi to have been chosen by the best students, so most rabbis were a little picky about who they accepted. But undeniably, the choosing of the teacher was in the hands of the student. And this made some sense because this wasn't just a decision of where to go to school for a few years. Becoming a Talmud was a significant commitment. It involved not just academic study, but a lifestyle of dedication to the rabbi, literally following him everywhere. Disciples would travel with, live with, and imitate their rabbi in every way. Their goal was to learn from the rabbi's teachings, behavior, and their interpretation of the Torah. And this really was all-encompassing. If your rabbi said a prayer after going to the bathroom, the whole group went into the bathroom with him so they could be ready in there to learn from his post-business prayer. Right? I mean, a funny example to be sure, but I'm not making it up. Rabbinical ba post-bathroom prayers were a thing. Google it if you want to find a very interesting prayer to add to your repertoire. But the point is, the relationship between a rabbi and a Talmud was close and immersive. These disciples were expected to absorb not just the rabbi's way of life, but seeking to emulate his character in, in everything about their understanding of the scriptures. The goal of being a Talmud was not just to gain knowledge, but to absorb it, to become copies of your rabbi. And because of this deep life commitment, the student chose the rabbi. That's just how it worked. But then Jesus goes against this custom and starts picking his own Talmudim. And not only that, he's not picking them from a group of students who are looking for a rabbi. Jesus doesn't review their applications and select the best qualified. Jesus seemingly just walks around and grabs you know, a few fishermen here, a tax collector there, not guys who were looking to be called into this role. No, instead, instead Jesus calls them to, to leave everything unplanned and follow him. A rabbi, they, they didn't really know. Unlikely disciples following an unlikely rabbi. Which is why their responses are just so incredible. Andrew, John, Peter, James, and the other John all just drop their nets and follow Jesus. In our reading, Philip meets Jesus, and when Jesus says, follow me, he doesn't object to this presumptuous call to redirect Philip's life. No, instead, Philip goes and he gets Nathaniel and tells him that they found the Messiah, the one about whom Moses and the prophets wrote about. He is Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And Nathaniel's response to Philip's news is skeptical. Nazareth? Can anything good come from backwater in Nazareth? And this skepticism, it's not unfamiliar to us, I think. How often have we doubted God's work because it didn't quite fit our expectations? How often have we questioned the possibility of God's grace in unlikely places or unlikely people? Nathaniel's skepticism is a mirror of our own doubts. Yet Philip doesn't argue with Nathaniel or try to convince him with theological discussion. He simply says, come and see. I love it. Right? The, the invitation is profound in its simplicity. 
It's an invitation to experience, to encounter Jesus personally. This is the essence of our faith journey. Not just to know about Jesus, but to know him, to experience his presence in our lives. You can't, you can't argue someone into faith. You invite them to meet Jesus. Come and see. So Nathaniel does. And as Nathaniel approaches Jesus, Jesus describes him as an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Jesus sees Nathaniel not just with his eyes, but he sees into his heart. Because Jesus sees us for who we truly are. He knows us more deeply than we know ourselves. He recognizes our sincerity as well as our struggles. This knowledge is not to condemn, but to invite us into a relationship built on truth and authenticity. And Nathaniel is astonished. He asks, how do you know me? Jesus replies, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I love this tiny little miracle. Because it is a little miracle. Right? It's perhaps the, the dinkiest little miracle of all of Jesus' miracles. Right? I mean, it's not exactly walking on water or calming the storm, healing the sick, or raising the dead, right? It's, it's divine peekaboo, right? Kind of the silliest of all the miracles. And yet, Nathaniel is amazed. He immediately is ready to follow Jesus. Not only that, but look what he says. He goes from what good comes out of Nazareth to Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Even Jesus is surprised by the intensity of Nathaniel's immediate faith. Jesus says to him, and, and I kind of picture him chuckling a bit and delighted as he says this. He says, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? <laughs> you will see greater things than these. Oh boy, Nathaniel, you ain't seen nothing yet. Jesus promises him that before this journey is over, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That will be a flashy miracle. Just wait, wait to feast your eyes on that. Just like Philip, we are called by Jesus to be his disciple, his Talmud. Not just to learn from him, but to emulate him, to become him to become little Christs, Christians. Rest assured, Jesus sees you while you sit under the fig tree in your still, quiet, solitary moments. And he calls you. He chooses you. Against all expectation, or perhaps even reasoning, he calls you. This call, it, it might come through a personal encounter, a sermon, a scripture passage, even through another person. The critical question is, how are you responding to that call? Are you willing to leave behind your comfort zone and follow Jesus? Following Jesus today means aligning our lives with his teachings, embracing his values of love, grace, justice, and mercy and living out these values in our interactions with others. Not just following, but becoming Jesus to the world. Are you, like Philip, eagerly following and inviting others to experience Jesus? To come and see for themselves? Are you, like Nathaniel, moving from initial skepticism to an unshakable faith that recognizes Jesus as the Son of God? Are you eagerly looking for the greater things that Jesus has promised to reveal to us? Or are you at a place where the, the nets of your life feel a little too heavy to drop? Perhaps your faith walk feels more like a struggle than a sprint. If so, remember that our Lord did not call the equipped. He equipped the called. He does not set a prerequisite of perfection for those he invites to discipleship. Instead, he takes our doubts, our imperfections, our pasts, and our failings, and he leads us to forgiveness and new life. You don't 
have to be perfect. Even if you've broken all seven commandments, or you didn't particularly feel like rolling out of bed and coming to church on this cold morning. Just make sure that you're open to Christ's work in your life. May you respond to his call with a willing heart. And may you always be eager to come and see your Lord. Amen. Now know that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now stand as the offerings are brought forward to the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, striving to be disciples called by Jesus, we bring our offerings with hearts eager to follow and serve. May these gifts help spread your word as Philip and Nathaniel were drawn into your fold. Let our giving reflect our dedication to your work, enabling others to find and know you, the God who sees us under our own fig trees and calls us into a life of greater purpose. Amen. Let us now confess together our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O oh Lord, put a new song in our mouths. Lead us out of all deceit and into the confidence of your truth. Let us proclaim your wondrous deeds of faithfulness and salvation in Christ without fear or hesitancy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King of Israel, as you once called Samuel, Philip, and Nathaniel into your service, be pleased now to call men into your holy ministry. Give them a delight in your holy scriptures, that their witness would leave many to follow Jesus, the Son of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you call fathers, mothers, and children to serve in their households. Let them serve eagerly, each according to their station, trusting that such love honors you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, let all the nations and peoples of the earth ascribe to you the glory due your name. Hear our prayers for all rulers and leaders, especially for our president and our governor, together with all legislatures and judges. Direct them by your word and spirit, and establish them in our saving faith. Lead them in their offices to govern wisely for the good of their people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, behold in mercy all for whom we pray, especially those we lift up to you this day, including Janet, Mary Alice, Jeff, Becky, Alan, Henry, and Jim. Bring healing, comfort, strength, patience, and certainty to all in need. 
Receive our thanks for your constant watch and merciful kindness. And every sorrow and every joy, do not let our eyes be drawn from the greater marvel of your kindness in Christ Jesus, by whose grace and forgiveness alone we receive ever blessing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, mighty God, you have shown us the face of your mercy in your Son, through whom all nations may find unity in life. Hear the prayers of your people and grant what is needful to us and to those for whom we pray, that trusting in your mercy, our hearts may find perfect peace and rest. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. We sing together hymn number 533, Jesus has come and brings pleasure.